Ladies and gentlemen, pleased to have in celebration of the 67th birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the 28th King Week celebration, and the 10th anniversary of the national holiday. We welcome the President of the United States. And now we begin our program with the presentation of the flag of nations. the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, followed by Lift Every Voice and Sing.
seated. And now we call the Reverend Dr. Joseph L. Roberts, Jr., the pastor of this historic Ebenezer Baptist Church to bring the call to commemoration. Mr. President, Mrs. King, members of the King family, persons who visit us from the federal government, those who visit us from the state and from the city, all officials, all friends, all brothers and sisters. It is a great joy for me to welcome you to this house uh, where people so frequently come on pilgrimages to see if we can once again find the intrinsic seed that fired the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. Without question or without the possibility of successful contradiction, Dr. Martin Luther King is first and foremost a superb role model for ministry, regardless of denomination or religious distinctions or differences. He possessed an appropriately diverse and deep range of interests and commitments, and all of the accompanying gifts. He was fired by a brilliant intellect. He had a profoundly analytical understanding of God's action in the critical moments of our spiritual, personal, political, social, cultural, and economic engagements. Few before him or since have been able to stand anywhere near him in his use of his gifts and his endowments during his entirely too brief pilgrimage on this earth. We assemble here today not only to remember his birth, but far more importantly to remember his colossal involvements for our good during his courageous lifetime. Yes, Dr. King wore a universal mantle, and he wore it so well. And didn't he really live out the mandate of his beloved prophet Micah? He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. But let us also listen to the words of Dr. King, for soon after the presidential campaign of 1964, he wrote an article entitled, Negroes Are Not Moving Too Fast, in response to some leaders in high places who maintained that this was precisely the problem, that African Americans wanted to move too swiftly toward the full satisfaction of constitutional guarantees. And Dr. King quoted the French novelist Anatole France whose life spanned its segments of the 19th and 20th century. As part of his response to this false allegation, Franz wrote, and these are his words, the law in its majestic equality forbids that any sleep under bridges, be they rich or poor. Well, let's make this contemporary. Mr. President, we're glad to have you in warm weather. We know, we know the storms and the struggles through which you and our country and our Congress have gone as all of us try to work together to produce an agreeable federal budget. But I thought of the quotation that Dr. King used because the other day it snowed in Washington. And I believe God gave us a nonpartisan wake-up call. Well, on the very day that 760,000 federal workers were to return to their, their posts after long negotiations over the federal government, a budget that will extend things until January 26, I guess God really told us 
who was in charge. Because God shut it all down, didn't he? <laughs> Through a prophetic and profound snowstorm. But the question that Martin King would raise is this. Where did the people in Washington sleep that night? The snow fell. The law and its majestic equality forbids that any sleep under bridges. Under bridges because they are homeless. Under bridges because their minds are confused and we have turned them out of mental institutions. Under bridges because they are in that number of 41 million people who have no health insurance and thanks be to God for the work you've done in that area. We cannot resist and Dr. King will not be satisfied in this commemoration until none sleep under bridges. Are we moving too fast? No, if poor people, whites and blacks and browns and reds, are still under bridges when the snow falls, then we are not moving too fast. We call you then. We call you to commemorate the birth and work of Dr. King and to finish the unchallenged business of finding the basics of food, clothing, and shelter for others. We thank God for this president who is sensitive to the sacredness of every personality and who joins us in saying, let the day come when none of God's children will have to sleep under bridges when the snow falls. And now our invocation by the Reverend Baron L. Broussard, pastor, Greater Rising Star Baptist Church, and this will be followed by the musical invocation, Come By Here, Kumbaya. Take the person that is closest to you by the hand. Let's pray together. God, in your word, you told us that we should always pray. So prayer is not new to us. We've been praying since Adam and Eve. We've prayed so that we could eat every day. We've prayed so that you'd protect us from danger. Noah prayed because it was raining and the people wouldn't listen. Through the years, our lives have been connected to you only through prayer. It's the way we talk to you and you to us. And so while we pray, we thank you for what you've already done, for what you're doing right now, and for the future, we pray. Yesterday we gathered in churches and mosques and synagogues all over the world, praying. And while we prayed, the crack addict still smoked. Someone's daughter abused her body. The poor were still poor. And when we finished praying and celebrating our belief and faith in you, Lord, it was disappointing to see that not much had changed. But we're still praying. You told us to pray. We thank you for the things that through the years you've blessed this people to have and to do and to be. We thank you for the leader whose life we celebrate today. He prayed. And like him, we're still praying. But God, after we've said amen, it's so sad that the most important part of prayer is often the most neglected part. When we say amen, we have to listen. 
And so now that a man is coming, speak, Lord, when we've finished our prayers. Speak clearly, God, so that the brilliant and the simple both will understand. Give us direction for our lives. Some of us really are lost. And we need you to tell us what to do. So thank you. Thank you for telling us to pray. Thank you for hearing when we pray. Oh God, but most of all, we need you to speak now. So that everyone in this room and everyone who's listening and watching will realize that our God is alive. So that the heathen will understand that our God really does answer the prayers of all of his people. You've got to talk now, God. It's gone crazy in the world. And you need to speak in such a way, Father, please speak, so that the world will listen and do exactly what you say. You said we ought to pray, and we're praying. We ask you now, Father, that you speak. We come in the name of Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. We come in the name of Jehovah Shama, the God who's here right now. We come in the name of Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. And all the people who understood said together, Amen. Now for our scripture reading for the morning, the Old Testament reading by Rabbi Stanley M. Davids is a New Testament reading by the Reverend Constance D. Belmore. The word of God as spoken to the prophet Amos as exemplified by the life 
and the passion of Martin Luther King, our friend, our teacher, our prophet. Shimu et tatabar hazeh, asher anochi nose alechem kina, beit Yisrael, nafla, lo tosif kum betulat Yisrael, nicha al admata, ein mekima. Kicho amar Adonai Elohim ha'ir ha'yotzet elef, tashir mea, Vayotzet mea, Tashir asara levet Yisrael, hear this word, which I intone as a dirge over you, O house of Israel, fallen, not to arise again, is maiden Israel, abandoned on her soil with none to lift her up. For thus said the eternal God about the house of Israel, the town that marches out a thousand strong shall have a hundred left, and the one that marches out a hundred strong shall have but ten left. Thus said the Eternal to the house of Israel, Seek me, and you will live. Do not seek Bethel, nor go to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall go into exile, and Bethel shall become a delusion. Seek the eternal, and you will live. Else God will rush like fire upon the house of Joseph and consume Bethel with none to quench it. Ah, you who turn justice into wormwood and hurl righteousness to the ground, Seek the Eternal, who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns deep darkness into dawn and darkens day into night, who summons the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the earth. The name of God is Adonai. Surely the day of the Eternal shall be not light, but darkness. Blackest night without a glimmer I loathe. I loathe, I spurn your festivals. I am not appeased by your solemn assemblies. If you offer me burnt offerings or your meal offerings, I will not accept them. I will pay no heed to your gifts of fatlings. Spare me the sound of your hymns and let me not hear the music of your lutes but let justice well up like water, righteousness like an unfailing stream. Let justice well up as water, righteousness like an unfailing stream. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in the 13th verse, chapter. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. <clears throat> if I give away all I have and deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, 
but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. <clears throat> so faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Here ends the reading. In keeping with our theme for the week, passing the torch, igniting the vision of a new generation, to lead our litany of commemoration we have Master Allende Jean Baptiste, who will lead us in the litany. We ask that you will stand God and- God will... wisely has chosen men and women to serve him in each era. Such a servant of our Lord God was Martin Luther King Jr., whose birth we now commemorate. We are thankful for the life of this 20th century prophet of freedom, who has joined the prophets of history in the cry, Martin Luther King Jr. envisioned the ultimate freedom, the freedom achieved in struggle, the freedom reached in brotherhood, the freedom fired by the dream of a man, the freedom inspired by the lot of a people, the freedom free from hate, the freedom full of love. He came into our lives when the yearning of people to be free had turned their attention to justice. For justice and only justice we shall follow that we may live and inherit the land which the Lord our God gives us. He reminded us that the spirit of man soars from the depths of despair with the strength and belief in the promise of the creator of the universe. We know and we testify. The Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. And so he set off with us on a journey for justice. It was a journey proclaiming the words of the ancient prophet Amos. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. It was a journey calling forth the modern Christian ministry to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. In the name of God, Amos, and in the name of the suffering people, let my people go. The journey went to Montgomery to affirm human dignity and courage, to Birmingham to defeat the sickness of separating human life, to Selma to ensure the equality of people in human affairs to hundreds of nameless communities to remove painful shackles of oppression and light joyous torches of liberty. In the name of this journey toward freedom, let my people go. When war was encountered, the leader sang with his people, ain't gonna study war no more. When violence was met, he spurned it and said, hate is too great a burden to bear. And even when death was confronted, as the journey reached Memphis, he could say in final triumph that in life he had found something worth dying for, something worth life itself, the promised land, the land of freedom and justice. And so we're thankful that the Spirit of the Lord anointed a man who preached good news to the poor 
A man who rejected segregation and embraced liberation. A man who prophesied the greatness of his people in struggle for the deliverance of all people. We praise the Lord God for sending us a man of peace who resisted tyranny, a man of nonviolence who fought for liberty, a man of God who worked for people. Thank you, Lord, for Martin Luther King Jr., who inspired us with his dream, who walked into our lives and our hearts with his marches for justice who demanded freedom with great courage in the face of grave danger and who has now passed on into your promised land. Thank you for this noble legacy to continue the journey to that land here on earth in life for all people. Thank you, Lord. You have sent us one who now causes us to say, in the name of Martin Luther King Jr., let my people go. passing the torch to a new generation. Our future is in good hands, a young day. And now a solo, Ride On King Jesus, by Mr. David Arnold of the Metropolitan Opera Company.
Our greetings for the morning will begin with the Honorable Paul D. Coverdale, United States Senate, Georgia. Mr. President, the King family, Governor, Mr. Mayor, the church, distinguished guests. I am always humbled by this sanctuary. It is indeed a peaceful place. We gather here this morning to celebrate freedom in the name of a man who lived to make people free in a nation born to make people free in a world all too often, often absent freedom. It was Dr. King himself who phrased the famous quotation, when we let freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men, and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Amen. To truly celebrate freedom, requires a constant vigil, for it is precious, but elusive, and never certain, even in the best of places. Thomas Jefferson, in his first inaugural address in the new Senate chamber in Washington, said, still one thing more, fellow citizens. A wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. The Constitution was constructed by those whose study of history made them wary of people and government's readiness to usurp liberty and freedom. It was designed to constrain such tendencies. Freedom of our time is abridged when government impounds too severely the natural pursuits of its citizens. Freedom of the future is abridged when contemporary requirements consume the resources needed by the future. As Mahatma Gandhi said, truth resides in every heart, and one has to search for it there and to be guided by truth as one sees it. But no one has a right to coerce others to act according to his own view of truth. Several years ago, I was in Bangladesh, the poorest country in the world, on the day they created their democracy. A Bangladeshi said, the responsibility of your nation is awesome. I don't envy it, but I pray, sir, that you and your fellow citizens will continue to accept it. The way to be the beacon of liberty to our friend in Bangladesh is to secure it, watch over it, and nurture it at home. For no government, no government, is free of a tendency to abrogate freedom not even ours. So let this celebration remind us 
that to truly honor Martin Luther King, we continue his work, the pursuit of freedom. And may God bless our journey. Now the Honorable Zell Miller, Governor, State of Georgia. Yes. Mr. President, we are always honored to have you in our state. Mrs. King, Dexter Scott King, and members of the King family, Senator Coverdale and Representative John Lewis and Mayor Campbell, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. I am pleased to once again be here to bring you greetings on behalf of the state of Georgia. Bring greetings to this distinguished gathering who are here to honor and commemorate the life and the memory of Martin Luther King, Jr. We all know the old story in the Old Testament about how a young man, Moses, was tending the sheep and encountered a bush that was on fire. And you remember the voice of God spoke to Moses calling him to lead his people out of bondage and promising to bring them to a land that flowed with milk and honey. But as you may also remember, it turned out to be a long, slow journey with a lot of struggle and hardship along the way. Not until many years had passed and Moses had died did Joshua finally arrive at Jericho to bring down the walls. Now, why am I reminding you of this well-known story? Because, of course, there is a lesson here for all of us. It was hard for the children of Israel to keep the dream alive during all those many years when it sometimes seemed that they would never, never reach the goal. It was a struggle to stay focused on the vision and it was difficult to instill it into each new generation. Like Moses, Martin Luther King Jr. started us off on a journey, a journey toward the promised land, a land where, as he put it, the sons of slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Today, like the children of Israel of long ago, we are still struggling on that journey, and we face the challenge of keeping the dream alive for each new generation. So today, as we give thanks for Dr. King's life, as we celebrate the many ways in which he changed our nation and our world for the better, let us pause to recapture his dream. The great artist and songwriter Chris Christopherson, who is here this morning and as he always has been for so many years, had an early song entitled, To Beat the Devil. And he's got a verse in there after he is told uh, that no one cares what you have to say. He speaks back to the devil and he says, you still can hear me singing to the people who don't listen to the things that I am saying, hoping someone's going to care. And then he ends it with, because I don't believe that no one wants to know. Let us keep singing. Let us renew our commitment and our determination to press forward together on the journey toward the promised land. Now the mayor of the city of Atlanta, the Honorable William Campbell. To Mrs. King and Dexter King and the King family and the 
the Abernathy family and Senator Coverdale, Governor Miller, Congressman Lewis, Congresswoman McKinney, to Council Members Pam Alexander and Mary Davis, Jim Maddox, and Debbie Starnes, and to all of those who have come to worship in this great day, and mostly to our President, yes. President Bill Clinton, not just the President of the rich and the powerful, but of the weak and the poor, and of all the people of this country. We're proud to have you here in our great city. And we're particularly proud, Mr. President, that you have come directly from our troops in Bosnia to come and celebrate this King holiday in the city where Dr. King was born, raised, educated, and preached his great gospel of human and civil rights. And Dr. King's message is one that has touched all people from all walks of life, men and women, boys and girls, brothers and sisters whose common link is their belief in what Dr. King stood for. And in this great city, where Dr. King's message has reverberated like ripples from a pond all across the world, we're proud of what he stood for. And Mr. President, we're proud of what you stand for. This year's theme. This year's theme, passing the torch, igniting the vision of a new generation, is particularly appropriate and reflects the needs of new leadership, such as young Master Batiste here, who ignited this church with his fiery litany. Because remember, it was Dr. King who said that a genuine leader does not reflect consensus. He molds consensus. And so today, there's a trumpet call for new leadership everywhere all across this country to rise up and carry on the mantle of the works and the life of Dr. King. But far too many of our young people are disenchanted with the political process, and they do not believe that this system works. It has not produced the kind of results that were intended. But Langston Hughes, the great black poet, said, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams. And we can look around this country, and we can see the sons and daughters of great leaders, such as Dexter King, and Jesse Jackson, and Ralph Abernathy, standing up and leading the torch for a brighter tomorrow. But we need more new leaders to get involved. Far too often, there is silence. If we look on our colleges and our universities and our high schools, in the streets of our society, we see young people who do not want to be involved in the political process. They are disenchanted and alienated from the ugliness of it all. But we recognize that the political process is the most revolutionary act to change society. And just as Dr. King used it, we must use it again and again. As former Mayor Maynard Jackson has said often, the challenge is not just to get free, it is to stay free. And so as we celebrate the true meaning of Dr. King's birthday, let us look to the future in these new leaders, young men and women. Let us help them to rise up and answer the trumpet call for justice and peace. But let us now also forget what we must do as leaders. You know, the happy warrior Hubert Humphrey said it best. The moral test in any government is how it treats its citizens in the dawn of life, the children, the twilight of life, the elderly, and the shadows of life, the disabled, the needy, the infirm. Mr. President, you have met that test, but others have not. We welcome you to the South. I'm proud to be a Southerner, born in the South, raised in the South, educated in the South. When I die, I want a Southern preacher to preach my funeral, because I know I'll get an extra hour before I go under.
And so, and so it is on this King holiday. The one thing that we know is that God is good all the time. Mr. President, stay strong. Tell Mrs. Clinton to stay strong. We're not going to let her attack her either. Remember, my friends, if we don't fight for what we want, then we deserve what we get. May God bless us all. Thank you, Mayor Campbell. Uh, we thought we were listening to elected officials. I think we have some ministers that we have been listening to. Uh, <laughs> but now I bring to you the Honorable John Lewis, who is an authentic minister. <laughs> the Honorable John Lewis, our United States Congress, and our fifth Congressional District of Georgia representative. Yeah. President Clinton, Chairman Dexter King, Mrs. King, Mrs. Farris, Reverend King, and other members of the King family, Pastor Roberts, my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, next door neighbor. My colleague from Maryland, Congressman Infume from Baltimore, welcome. <laughs> Senator Coverdale, Governor Miller, my friend and former office mate, uh, he put me out of the office, that's why I went to Washington. Uh, Bill Campbell, Mayor Campbell, <laughs> and all the other honorable elected officials, members of the clergy, my sisters and brothers. I'm pleased to greet you on the 10th anniversary of the national holiday and the 67th birthday honoring the most peaceful warrior of the 20th century, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Mr. President, we are deeply honored and blessed that you would take the time to come to Atlanta in honor of Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs> Mr. President, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. had you in mind when he said in 1957, give us the ballot and we will send to Washington men and women of vision, men and women of courage. If Martin Luther King Jr. could speak to us today, on this day, his 67th birthday, he would encourage all of us during this election year to support courageous leaders, leaders who will have the moral courage and vision to use the tremendous resources of our nation not to oppress, but to uplift. Not to divide, but to bring together. And not to enslave, but to set free. Martin Luther King Jr. must be looked upon as one of the founding fathers of the new America. This man taught us the message of peace, love, and nonviolence. Through his actions and through his words, he liberated and freed not just a people, but an entire nation. 
If Martin Luther King Jr. had the power and the capacity to inspire young children and old women and men in Birmingham to stand up and face police dogs, fire hoses, and bull Connor, to face Sheriff Clark in Selma, to face George Wallace in Alabama, we should have the courage to stand up and face Newt Gingrich here in Georgia. friend, my hero, my brother. Happy birthday, Dr. King. Thank you, Reverend Congressman John Lewis. <laughs> and now we will hear a selection from our commemorative choir for the day, and that is entitled Hymn for Our Times. The commemorative service choir is comprised of members of the choruses of Morehouse and Spelman Colleges, the Atlanta University Center Community Chorus, the choirs of Ebenezer Baptist Church, and the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Chorus. Dr. David Mara, director of the Morehouse College Glee Club, is the director, and our organist is Dr. Joyce Finch Johnson.
Let the church say amen. amen. We come to that time in our program where we give tribute to the man we've come to commemorate, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Daddy. And what better place to start than with one who knew him, who knew him before he was? Because she was a part of the very household which he would come to join two years after she was born. His sister, only living immediate relative in that family, Mrs. Christine King Farris. And as I thought about how I would introduce Aunt Christine, I allowed my mind to think about this one thing. Death oftentimes comes to separate. It separates people from places. It separates family members. And at a time when death came in 1968, it did not separate Mrs. Christine King Ferris and Mrs. Coretta Scott King. At a time when death separates in-laws, I thank God for what he did in 1968. And I allowed my mind to flirt with Sister Naomi in the Bible. And I remembered when, that when death sought to separate her from her daughter-in-law, there was one daughter-in-law who said to Sister Naomi that even though my sister is going to leave, I'm going to clean. And wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And I imagine that was the same thing that happened with Sister Christine King Ferris and Mrs. Coretta Scott King as they set off on a journey. Mrs. Christine King Ferris, as Ruth to support Naomi, Mrs. Coretta, Scott King. And they stood together in the good and the bad, in the sad times and the joyous times, in the controversial and even, and even in the comforting times. And I asked myself, what would cause one to do that? And I introduced her like this. This is a woman who loves God. This is a woman who's committed to her family. And this is a woman who understood what the Bible said when it said, let nothing separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's the love of God that keeps families together and that has inspired Sister Christine King Ferris to be a part of continuing this legacy with Sister Coretta Scott King. Thank you, my niece, Reverend Bernice King, Mr. President, Mr. Dexter Scott King, our chair, president and CEO, and my nephew, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, my dear sister-in-law, to all of those assembled here on the dais today, I am very humble to have the opportunity to pay a tribute to my brother, Martin Luther King, Jr. I haven't had opportunity to do, do this before. You have not seen me, many of you, before. And I have said often that when my brother was living, I served as his support in the background, and that was great. Whenever he came home, he needed someone to be there. 
and we as a family were there. When he passed and was taken away from us, I said, I must do something now, I must step out. And I joined with my sister-in-law and my sister, Coretta Scott King, to see what I could do to perpetuate his legacy. So whatever I do for the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change and for the community at large, I am trying to perpetuate that great legacy that was left to us. America and the world honor Martin Luther King Jr. because by his preaching, by his example, by his leadership, and by his accomplishments, he and the movement he led moved us closer to the ideal on which America was founded. He challenged us to make real the promise of America as a land of freedom, equality, opportunity, brotherhood, and sisterhood. He challenged us to embrace nonviolence as a way of life, to understand our common humanity with all peoples, and to view racial and cultural diversity as a source of strength, not discord. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man with a plan and a program for revolutionary change. He didn't just talk, he worked to change institutions, practices, and individual attitudes. In the end, he improved the quality of life for millions in America and gave hope to still more millions around the world. In a few short years, he helped change America for all time. And though he accomplished a great deal during his lifetime, Martin Luther King Jr. was never able to complete what he had started. He, he did, however, leave for us a blueprint for the rest of us to follow. And so if Martin's dream has not been fulfill, it is we who are to blame, for it is we who inherited his dream, and it is he, we, who must finish what he started. Martin Luther King, Jr. ascended into glory, but he left us to tell the story. And I would like to share just a little quote of a story he shared at the Chicago Freedom Festival in, in the late 1960s, just before he was taken from us. And I quote, let us be dissatisfied until all men and women, I add, will have food and material necessity for their business, culture, and education for their minds, freedom and dignity for their spirits. Let us be dissatisfied until every handcuff of poverty is unlocked and work-starved men will no longer walk the streets in search of jobs that do not exist. Let us be dissatisfied until race barriers disappear from the political arena, until brotherhood becomes more than a meaningless word in an open, opening prayer, but the order of the day on every legislative agenda. Let us be dissatisfied until the sacred halls of Congress are filled with men and women who will do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God. Let us be dissatisfied until men everywhere will be imbued with a passion for justice, until the lion and the lamb will lie down together, and every man and woman will sit under his or her own vine and fig tree, and none 
will be a threat. With the poignant challenge, I say to you, don't ever be afraid to dream. Everything important begins with a dream or an idea. And Martin's dream moved an entire nation to change for the better. His dream is alive today because it lives in each of us and it's always there challenging in us to do better with our lives, the communities in which we live, and with our nation. You and I have a dream. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Thank you, Reverend Ferris. I guess it runs in the family, in the genes. I want to thank you for reminding us of the us and our individual responsibility to continue the work and the legacy of Martin Luther King, Jr. We will now continue with our tributes. The Honorable Kwaizi Mfumi who is the congressman from Baltimore, Maryland, former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Most importantly, he's known for his espousal of business and economic development as the best weapons in the fight for equality. Mr. Mfumi, or the Honorable Mfumi, has now accepted the challenge to lead the NAACP, the National Advance, uh, Association for the Advancement of Colored People, into the 21st century. Uh, Mr. Mfumi, as president and chair-elect, excuse me, president and CEO of elect of the NAACP will be followed by Ms. Bellin Robles, who has made history as the first woman president of the League of United Latin American Citizens, which is the oldest and the largest Hispanic civil rights organization in this country. And she will be followed by Mr. Yuji Miyamoto, the Japanese Consul General, who serves here in Atlanta. Mr. President, the leader of all Americans. We thank you for the simple eloquence of your example and for the mantle of your leadership. To Mrs. King and Chairman Dexter King, members of the King family, distinguished elected officials, honored guest. In a speech delivered in 1848 in Edwardsville, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln addressed these words to his countrymen and I quote, he said, when you have succeeded in dehumanizing the Negro, when you have put him down and made it but for him to be but as the beast of the field, when you have extinguished his soul in this world and placed him where the ray of hope is blown out, as in the darkness of the damned, are you quite sure that the demon you have roused will not turn and Ren Yu. What constitutes, he asks, the bulwark of our freedom and of our independence? It is not our crown and battlements, our bristling sea coast, our army, or our navy. These are not our reliance against tyranny, said Lincoln, for all those may be turned against us without having made us weaker for the struggle. Our reliance, he said, is in the love of freedom which prides itself as the heritage of all men in all lands everywhere. Destroy that spirit, he admonished, and you have planted the seeds of despotism at your own doorstep. Ignore the chains of bondage, and you prepare your own limbs to wear them. Accustomed to trample on the rights of others, and you then have lost the creative genius of your own independence, and as such, would become the fit subjects of the first cunning tyrant 
who rises among you. Lincoln's words, uttered over 140 years ago, have gone unheeded. Poverty, despair, hunger, homelessness, degradation, deprivation, denial, and disprivilege are all still too much a part of the American landscape. And yet against and out of that background of darkness, through the screaming halt of history came forward Martin Luther King, Jr., a man unawed by opinion, unseduced by flattery, undismayed by disaster. He confronted life with the courage of his convictions and confronted death with the courage of his faith. He taught us that if we did not heed those words of Lincoln, that racism, bigotry, and inequality would continue to blight our land. It does not now come in 1996 in the form of hooded horsemen with burning crosses, but rather in a far more prevalent subliminal way, a way that racism lurks just beneath the surface. People are still discriminated against Martin because of the color of their skin, because of their income, because of their language, because of their gender or their orientation. That kind of prejudice still denies people jobs, denies them housing, denies them dignity and self-esteem. And it goes to the root of the daily, seemingly inextricable problems that we as a nation face. And it has the potential, if we are not careful, to rob our children of their honor and their self-respect. Yet someone had to step forward and enunciate the bitter truth. So we come here today to remember that person and to remember the lesson of his legacy. Hate radio, hate speech, hate groups, and hate crime are still attempting to divide and conquer our nation's greatest asset, its people. We then must find new and different ways to stand forward and not give up. For if Dr. King were to crawl into this sanctuary today and climb on this podium, looking out at the face of America, its many colors, shades, and hues, and its many problems, perhaps he would say in closing, as I say, that I have not given up on the American ideal or on the American possibility. And I ask you not to give up also. I am convinced that this nation still stands before the world as perhaps the last possibility of an expression of man, devising a social order where justice is the supreme ruler and law is but its instrument, where freedom is the dominant creed and order but its principle, where equity is the common practice and fraternity the true human condition. It is also my conviction this generation of Americans who sit here today, we in fact may be the last generation to be afforded another chance. Another chance to balance the scales of justice and to make them equal. Another chance for us to confront the doors of opportunity and to make them open. Another chance for us to seize, as Martin King did, the chains of bondage and to set and break them free. And so, my friends, when the timid say they fear even to try anymore, we must reply that we still have a shining and powerful dream given by a shining and powerful God. When we hear that new version of an old song that speaks of gradualism, when we are told to wait for tomorrow and the next tomorrow, for the next election and the next generation, we must reply as Martin King did from an old Birmingham jail that now is the time. Now is always the time. And when they saw him from afar, even before he had come near to them, the book of Genesis reminds us that they conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some old pit. And we will say that some beast has devoured him, 
and we shall see what becomes yeah. of his dream. Mr. President, Mrs. Toretta Scott King, members of the King family, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters. It is an honor for me to be here to pay tribute to the work and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am very happy to be here representing LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, which has a long and storied history of fighting for the civil rights of Hispanic Americans. As a Latina and a member of LULAC for over 35 years, I have seen the slow but inexorable march of civil rights movement in this nation. The gains that have been made have come through the efforts of men and women who have ye given years of time and effort, and yes, sadly, even, even their lives in attainment of these goals. This we must remember. The heritage that we celebrate today is one of struggle and commitment to what is right. It is a story that we must continually retell and in retelling, keep alive the spirit of liberty and equality. And let us stand guard against trivialization of history, lest through trivialization we slide into apathy and a false sense of contentment. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once wrote, and I paraphrase, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. We must see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through tireless efforts and persistent work of men and women willing to be co-workers with God. My father once told me that work, hard work and effort, things too easily acquired become trivial. For our children and our children's children, we must keep alive the spirit of the struggle of civil rights and the price so dearly paid. As a nation, we must fully embrace the life and work of Dr. King, not as a chapter in the history of one man or one group, but as the life and work of a great American who worked for the rights of all people. Today, there are those who would roll back the clock on civil rights and equal opportunity. Some have even suggested amending the US Constitution to change the definition of citizenship, perhaps creating different levels of, citizen, of citizenship. Who would they put in the lower classes of citizenship? It doesn't take a genius. It would be you and I. These zealots would do this to save America. Yet we know their efforts are based on personal hatreds and dislikes for people who are different from themselves. <laughs> Thus, today we honor the work and the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, and through him honor the men and women who walked shoulder to shoulder with him in battle for freedom and justice. Because of his work and life and the sacrifices of countless of others, we are a better nation today. This we must remember. But if we are here today to honor the, the memory of a great American, then we must remember his life, not as a historical icon, but rather as a living body of knowledge, devotion, and dedication to a belief that all are created equal and that this nation must live up to its promise or perish in the flames of violence, discord, and confusion 
caused by hatred and racism. I am here today in the spirit of Martin Luther King of unity and hope. Only through interracial cooperation and demagoguery. Let us then join together all the peoples of diverse origins and let us base our lives and work on peaceful resistance to racism, divisiveness, and hatred. The greatest challenge we face as a nation is not from without, but from within. Our only hope is that we will learn to live together as a people not separated by differences, but enriched by the tapestry of a nation of diverse peoples. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream, and his dream lives on in us and in every good and decent man, woman, and child who believe that the worth of a human being is in their deeds and not in the color of their skin, that the goodness of a human being outweighs the differences in their beliefs and origins. His dream lives on in us as a legacy, as a duty, and as a responsibility. This, this we must remember, and this we must never forget. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. <coughs> Excuse me, Coret Scott King, Mr. Dexter Coret King, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to address this gathering in remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the ideals he espoused. The significance of this great occasion, that it is now in its 10th year as a national holiday, continues to expand throughout the world. In every country of the globe, wherever there is a desire to combat social injustice through the power of a superior philosophy, the spirit of Dr. King lives on. In my country of Japan, Dr. Martin Luther King is a well-known and revered historical figure whose courage and ideals are deeply admired. In recognition of his greatness, His Majesty the Emperor and Empress of Japan visited the King Center during their visit to Atlanta in June of 1994 and laid a wreath in tribute at Dr. King's tomb. I feel privileged to have lived here in the United States for the past year, representing Japan to the Southeast. I'm convinced that this is a truly great nation. Its wealth and power are apparent to all, but its fundamental and most enduring greatness resides in the world of the mind, epitomized by the immortal words of Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. This concept was a radical notion at the time more than 200 years ago, but in, it has the good fortune to be nurtured by the people of that new and brave social experiment called the United States of America. The belief in the God-given equality of human life has become a totally accepted and integral part of the fabric of America. In fact, it's the essence of being an American. Dr. Martin Luther King, as a young man growing up in the United States here in Atlanta, thought deeply about this profound truth. It sank into the deepest depths of his soul and became the core of his philosophy.
he took the idea one step further, developing an unshakable conviction within himself that not only are all men created equal, but that they should treat each other equals. This was his dream. His advocacy of nonviolence to achieve his dream is the expression of the power of a superior philosophy and morality. It is what makes him great and for which he would be remembered in my country and all over the world. In our everyday a human life and our dealings with each other, if we can bring ourselves to see each other clearly, not merely categorized as members of a particular race, but rather as fellow human beings sharing a common destiny here on this small blue planet, then Dr. King's dream will no longer be just a dream. It will be well on its way to becoming a reality. The people of Japan and all over the world look to you, America, through the power of your successful example and to Dr. King and his ideals to show us that a higher and more humane world really is possible. The path is clear. We need only the courage to walk down it together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Nfumi and Ms. Robles and Mr. Miyamoto. I once had a professor who said that laughing is jogging on the inside. And perhaps comedy as seen as just that, as soothing our very souls. But the genius of comedy, I think, is when it comforts our souls, but at the same time it disturbs our consciences where they are too comfortable. Mr. Dick Gregory is one of these types of comedians. And it is, his life is colored with his commitment to humanitarian efforts and his involvement in the civil rights movement where he can tell you his life was literally transformed by the work of Martin Luther King, Jr. He has reemerged as probably the leading social political comedian this country has known, and I thank God for him. He will come and will give a tribute to Dr. King and will be followed by Reverend Thomas Gilmore, who worked in the movement with Dr. King and was so pro profoundly influenced by my father that when he became the first African-American sheriff of Greene County, Alabama, he didn't carry a gun. And he was branded with the name the nonviolent sheriff. He now pastors the First Baptist Church in Inslee, Alabama, which was formerly pastored by Dr. King's brother and my uncle, Reverend Alfred Daniel King, Sr. Reverend Gilmore will be followed by Mrs. Ada Deer, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, the U.S. Department of the Interior. She will be followed by brief comments from Mr. Richard Trumka, the Secretary, Treasurer of the AFL-CIO, and Minister Jeff Hedebe, the Minister of Public Works of the Republic of South Africa, who has a delegation of four with him. Let me first say that I thank and praise God that we have all made it here safely today. And I pray to God that your return and my return will be equally as safe. Well, Mr. Mayor, when you um, said you was born in the South and Want to die in the South and be buried in the South with a Southern preacher, I'm sitting next to the ministers. <laughs> and they said, because of that statement, they're going to drop you right in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe you should consider 
being buried up north. <laughs> it had nothing to do with that. You said you get an extra hour. They got news for you. Twice today I was kind of, had my ego deflated. I uh, was running late and I thought everybody was up on the stage. I've been out with these voter registration with uh, SCLC. And uh, I thought that everybody was here and I ran in and I heard the choir doing that last verse about 50 times. So. <laughs> So I said to my son, I must run, they're waiting for me. <laughs> and I got up here and sit down and they kept singing. <laughs> and I realized the two of you hadn't showed yet. <laughs> and little brother, I can't tell you what you did for me. I mean, well, I'm not clapping like they clapping. I, I, you know, I'm a father of 10 children. So I was, I was in my little meditation when I heard this and I looked up, I was hoping you was like 42 years old or something. You know? <laughs> I, I, I got a, a brother in St. Louis. He had a lot of children. I called the house the other day and he said he wanted me to speak to his baby and I got on the phone and he said, hi, Uncle Dick. I love you, Uncle Dick. Uh, when are you coming to St. Louis? He's 27 years old. <laughs> so it kinda, it's kind of nice to be around brilliant children, you know. Like I said, I'm a father of 10 black children, but uh, no, it's not difficult. And, and, and I really, you know, we wouldn't uh, start off with 10. I, I, I had hit it real big and probably made more money in the early 50s than most black entertainers, and me and my wife started thinking black. <laughs> then we got into that white thing when the money came in, and I started reading the New York Times. <laughs> and I read this article one day, it said, typical American family. What are they talking about, white folks? <laughs> typical American families, two and a half children per family. And I said to my wife, look here, white folks and found out they have half babies. <laughs> well, we gonna teach them we can too. And I kept, we kept on for them half and whole ones kept coming out. <laughs> and then one day, one day, some folks got to me and said, no, that's just the way white folk count. To think I wanted to go to school with them. <laughs> and my brother, you were serious. When you talked about to Mr. President about that weather in Washington, D.C., I was there. I was there. And, and, and let, 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 let me tell you, that's the first time I ever been so cold in my life. If somebody would have told me to go to hell, I'd have packed my bag. <laughs> you serious? I mean, it was me. I mean, I looked in the closet to get my coat. My coat had on a coat. <laughs> and I must admit, Mr. President, I'm one of the few people that's, that's, uh, that's been praying that y'all don't get that budget thing straight, you know. I ain't gonna lie about it. I've, uh, I've told, this is the greatest nation, I've told my creditors, when America balance her books, I'll balance mine. <laughs> that's right. That's right. thought about doing it in the next seven years, you know. <laughs> but when we think about the greatness of this country, my sister, I heard you talk about the millions that your brother had touched. The millions. Uh, today, I just want to talk about one. The greatness of America. Because of that movement. 
I'm a good example, born on welfare, and one day we're going to tell the truth, welfare mothers, 80% of welfare mothers in America has never produced a child on welfare. Okay? Don't nobody want to talk about that, though. Welfare mothers have an average of one point five babies per mother. Married women have an average of 5.9. My wife got 10. <laughs> I ran for the presidency in 1968. Had I won, I ain't going to lie to you, I'd have had an all-black cabinet. <laughs> yeah. And if you could read or write and wasn't a third grade ghetto dropout, you couldn't have qualified. I said, we tried all these brilliant folks and everything's messed up. I'm going to get me some dumb ones. <laughs> and one of them would have been my real dumb cousin, Jabbo Jones. I'd have definitely made him Secretary of Defense. <laughs> now, some of you black folks laughing, but y'all be embarrassed when you see that Jabbo on them white shows, Meet the Press, and then white press saying, uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Jabbo, now that you're the Secretary, what are you planning on doing for defense? He said, well, first I'm gonna fix it, then paint it. <laughs> well, are you planning on, are you planning on sending any troops to Bosnia when I find out where it is I am? And you know, Miss, when I sit here, see, I, I, I keep Nuke with me. Because I mean, this, I mean, when you look at this picture, this boy wore down. And we got to be honest, black folks, this boy done had a, a bad two months. Started off with you when you carried him to Israel and made him a Negro for a day. That's right. him sit on the back of the plane, <laughs> get out the back door. <laughs> Boy got so upset being a Negro for the day, he came back and shut the government down. <laughs> I said, I said, Mr. President, thank God you didn't make him a Negro for a month. We'd be in World War III now. <laughs> Let me see. Let me say, let me say to my sister, Coretta, Mr. President, distinguished guests, my brother Dexter, in St. Louis, Missouri, there's a street named after me, and Dick Gregory Place runs out at Martin Luther King Boulevard. And I go there and stand there and pray and thank God. And I stand right where Dick Gregory bumps into Martin Luther King Boulevard because when Dick Gregory bumped into Martin Luther King and this great movement, that's when my life changed. And if you want to know the greatness of this movement, don't sit and look at the press, talk about some trial in LA have divided the America on racial line. This movement have got this country going in the right direction and nothing will divide this country. And it's Martin's spirit, that divine wisdom, has changed my life. It was the biggest entertainer going, first black comedian, they permitted to work white nightclubs. And then I come and got into this movement and y'all took me from being safe to where it was dangerous. And I thank God for that. When I say dangerous, I mean they've never assassinated an entertainer. Never assassinated a professional athlete. They never blow up black taverns and black nightclubs. They blow up black churches. 
kill civil rights workers. Thank God you brought me over here. Might be a little dangerous, but that's where God is. Because when I was on that other side, I was having fun. I used to drink so much whiskey. The state of Missouri was thinking about declaring me a beverage. <laughs> and now, thank God to this brother and this movement. I understand a little bit better now when I saw the snow because of the spirituality of this movement. I understand what, what, what Paul said when he said the foolishness of God is far greater than the wisdom of all of us. Oh, y'all hear about me fasting, but you never heard that I learned how to fast through Martin, fast away hatred and bitterness, because John Wayne was my hero. My mother permitted me to go to movies, and all the white folks said, it's OK to kill them if you're right. And then I bumped into this brother. It changed my life. Say killing under any circumstances. So he taught me how to fast away hatred and jealousy and meanness and, and feast on divine brotherhood and sisterhood. He taught me how to fast the way the belief that evil old men and evil old nations can stand in front of the way of God's goodness for us all. And so I say today, it was his divine love that, that didn't distinguish between one person to another. What a wonderful to know here's a brother that thinks the same way about the sinner he did about the saint. That's what this movement was about. And because the way this movement have touched me, I can go to bed every night and look at myself and say, thank God for King in this movement. I'm strong. I'm I'm positive, I'm powerful, I'm wise, I'm lovely, I'm fearless, I'm on my way because of King and this movement to being one of God's perfect children. And for that, I say thank you. God bless you. Mr. President, Mrs. King, President King, Reverend King, King family, elected officials, my friend, the gentleman from Georgia, Congressman John Lewis, my brothers and my sisters who are gathered here, it brings great joy to my heart to, to be here today to to share in this wonderful program. I, I am a black Baptist preacher born in the South. I expect to die in the South and be buried by a black preacher in the South as well. But I do not uh, expect to use all of my five minutes today and in fact, I'm looking forward to hearing from our President of the United States of America. My family, my church family, my friends, my brothers and sisters from Greene County, Alabama, the hamlet where Dr. King's disciples, James Orange, Ben Sunshine Owens, and others came and told me about Dr. King and what he had done for them. And I found in Deuteronomy, the fifth book of Moses, a tribute that was given Moses perhaps on one of these type days. And in chapter 34, verse 10, it is said, and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, 
to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel, none like Moses. Dr. King was my Moses, the 20th century Moses, and Alabama is a better place because Dr. King came our way. Not one time, but many times. In 1955, when I was just 14 years old, he came and showed us that we don't have to sit at the back of a bus because of the color of our skin. And again, in 1962, he came to Birmingham, Alabama, where I now live, as Reverend King has said, and pastor the church that her uncle, Reverend A.D. King, pastored for many years there, and live in the parsonage where he lived, and the parsonage that was bombed as they tried to kill both he and his brother, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., on April 12, 1963. Birmingham is a better place because Dr. King came to Birmingham, Alabama. And Dr. King made or helped to make Birmingham a better place. Selma, Alabama is a better place now because Dr. King came to Selma, Alabama and taught us how to use what God has already given us to make a big and better difference. It was Dr. King who, like Moses, had a rod. His rod was a rod of nonviolence. And he taught us nonviolence and love. And he taught us how to make change in our state. And I am a very fortunate man in that I was able to be a staff person in my community. And at that day, and you have to know back, unfortunately, we haven't told the story clear enough because it seemed that many think that things now, uh, things uh, as they used to be, uh, are something close to what it is now. But you need to remember and tell your children that at one time in Alabama, in Georgia, because of the color of our skin, we were put in the back of the bus, we were treated unfairly, but it was Dr. King who came to us, and for the first time in my life in 1955, it occurred to me because of what he did and was done, and even though I was a teenager, it occurred to me that I could be anything I wanted to be. Anything I wanted to be. And that spirit stayed with me, and in 19... Six, 1965, when he came to our hamlet, I had every intention, because of the spirit and the fire that he gave us, I had every intention uh, of being the first black sheriff in the world. In fact, there were three, uh, three things I wanted to do in 1965. I was yet 24. I wanted to be the first black sheriff in the world. I wanted to be the youngest sheriff in the world. I wanted to be the best looking sheriff in the world. Well, we lost that election in 65. But thank God with the fire that he put us in 1970, uh, we were able to win. And in 1971, nearly 25 years ago, the movement, Dr. King's movement made me sheriff of Greene County, Alabama. I have kept this badge and I've tried to I've tried to remember Dr. King's work and his philosophy. In fact, I, I own the gun. And I tried to find a good place to wear that gun. And, and we was having breakfast. My son, Ronald, who's here today, a young kid at the time, was 
drawing something on a piece of paper, and, and he had these two big guns strapped on me. He says, Dad, are this you? And I says, boy, I don't wear no two big guns and no 10-gallon hat. He said, but I can't draw the gun that you wear under your clothing. And at that day, I remembered, at that day, I remembered that you just can't be a hypocrite. You have to believe what you believe and do what you know is right. And finally, as I share this badge with you, finally, the best memory I have of Dr. King was the last time he was in Alabama. On the 20th of March in 1968, he was working for his Poor People Campaign and pulling us all together again. And he said to me, Tom, I want you to to, to manage a head up the wagon train for me. And when we left Utah, I had the privilege of driving he and Reverend uh, Dr. Abernathy and uh, Mrs. Dorothy Cotton and Brother Bernard Lee and, and Uncle Jose William in my 63 Chevy. I had the opportunity to drive them to Marion, Alabama. And en route to Marion, Alabama, somebody pulled a tractor trailer rig in front of us and stopped us and blocked us. And the young fellow got out of, the young white man got out of his tractor trailer rig and came back to that young man and said, young man, get back into your, uh, get back into your rig. Get back, you're trying to start trouble. When he saw the face of Dr. King, heard the voice of Dr. King, his countenance changed. He backed away. And on that drive back home alone, I thought like the disciples thought in Mark chapter 4, verse 41. What manner of man is this? Even the wind obeys voice. I have brought this badge to leave with President Dexter King and Mrs. King. I've kept it 25 years. I want to leave it here for the movement in the center. Would you please come? President, <clears throat> Mrs. King, President Dexter King, members of the King family, <laughs> governor, senator, congressman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, friends, most of all, brothers and sisters. We are here today to honor the life and contributions of Martin Luther King, Jr. Every American owes a debt to him for what he accomplished in his short life. 30 years later, much of his agenda has yet to be fulfilled. Martin Luther King worked for the dignity and justice for all people. And in that way, he has served as a beacon for me in my work. I speak to you as a proud member of the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, the first woman to serve as Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, and the honored recipient of the Martin Luther King 1995 Award from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. I heard Dr. King once in the early 60s as a young social worker in Minneapolis. I was struck by his small physical stature. But this impression was immediately and completely erased by his powerful presentation. His forceful message intensified my commitment 
to my social work profession. I was eager to do my part to remedy injustice. As we look at the world today, we see continuing social injustice, inequality, poverty, racism. While these conditions are very disheartening, Dr. King also faced these injustices, but refused to accept them and worked to change them. As he said in the January 1965 interview, quote, whatever my doubts, however heavy the burden, I feel that I must accept the task of helping people to make the nation and the world a better place to live in for all men, black and white alike, unquote. Each of us must also accept the task of making the world a better place, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. Remember, one person can make a difference. Each of us is able to do this in many small ways, beginning with voting. Only 37% of the electorate voted in the 1994 presidential election. This hard-won right, which Dr. King and others worked and sacrificed to obtain, must be exercised to make this country an equal and just society for all of us. As we reflect on Dr. King's life, we must remember his deep devotion to his fellow human beings. From the powerful elite to the garbage collectors, he respected their humanity and challenged them to do their part for social justice. His decision to use his unique combination of intellect, character, and spirituality to bring about effective social change presents a continuing challenge to us today. How do we meet this challenge? Let us gain strength. He knew that it would never come about by us being polarized. He knew that it would take all of us, all of us standing together, marching together, and fighting together. And that's still the type of coalition, the type of fight, the type of challenge that's in front of us today. And we know that building that kind of coalition for change won't come easy because there's a lot of resistance, a lot of attitude that we have to overcome. And I'll tell you, while we in organized labor have an awful lot to be proud of, while a lot of good trade unionists stood on the front lines with Dr. King, the fact is there were too many who only stood on the sidelines, far too many who never understood the stake that white workers had in the success of the civil rights movement. Far too many who forgot that the only color any boss ever sees is green. And the truth is, some of those attitudes linger on today. It's some rank and file union members who think the biggest threat to their jobs is an immigrant family coming north when it's really corporations moving south of the border. It's some middle class workers, a lot of them white, who think that their taxes are going up to pay for welfare for the poor, when the truth is what's driving their taxes up is welfare for the rich. And it's a working class, kids who once look down at a good paying job at the mine or the mill or the plant, but today who earn 25% less than a high school graduate did in 1979 and have bought on to the myth that something, it has to do with something called affirmative action. Now it's up to the labor movement and to all of us to challenge those kinds of attitudes. And part of that means reminding every working family that Dr. King's vision wasn't only a dream of dignity and respect and decency for black Americans, but it was a dream for all Americans. It was about, it was a lot more than electing African Americans to public office. It was about taking back the political process 
from an overclass of indifference to the needs of poor whites in Appalachia as it was to poor blacks in Atlanta. It was about redirecting 10, it wasn't about redirecting 10 or 20 or 30 millions of dollars in state contracts to a handful of black owned businesses. It was about redefining our entire country's priorities so that no American, no American would ever have to live in poverty. And his dream wasn't only about a few more men and women sitting in the corporate boardrooms. It was of an America where no worker, not black nor white, would ever be brutalized or exploited by any employer. It's up to all of us, black and white, Latino, Asian, Christian, and Jew, to pass the torch, to ignite the vision of a new generation, to fight the fight until justice is won, and to remind everybody that they may have killed the dreamer, but they will never, ever, ever kill the dream. Thank you. Mr. President, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, members of the King family, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is to me a great honor and privilege to be part of a huge historical moment representing our President Nelson Mandela and all of our people in the Republic of South Africa on this momentous occasion. I bring to you warm and fraternal greetings from our president. And it is equally my singular honor to share this magnificent rostrum with the President of the United States of America, Mr. Bill Clinton, a man who is a champion of peace in the world, trying to bring to an end death and destruction, especially in Bosnia. In the world calendar, January 15 will go down the annals of history as a day we celebrate the birthday of one of the greatest leaders this planet Earth has ever produced. Dr. Martin Luther King had a vision for peace. He had a vision that one day peace will prevail on Earth. He stood for the ideals of freedom he stood for the ideals of freedom amongst men and women. He fought against injustice. He fought to feed the hungry. He fought to clothe the naked. And he fought to free the captive. For championing the cause of men and women on earth, Dr. Martin Luther King was killed. He died that you and me one day must be free. Though he is dead, but he is not dead because he lives in our hearts. His legacy has been bequeathed in all over the world, especially in the Republic of South Africa, where our people, inspired by the wisdom and the cause of Dr. Martin Luther King, are fighting for justice, for equality, and for non-racialism. And under the leadership of our President Nelson Mandela, we are building a new life in the Republic of South Africa, where our people, both black and white, must live in peace and harmony. Mandela, like Dr. Martin Luther King, has sacrificed everything in life to lead his people to peace and freedom. For 27 years, Mandela languished in apartheid jails, and when he came out, he did not call for revenge. He did not call for retribution, but he called for peace and reconciliation. With the support of the international community, of which the American people have been one of those pillars in the world, we are now planting in the Republic of South Africa seeds of a new life 
seeds of democracy, seeds of non-racialism, and economic prosperity. Mr. President, I would like to take this opportunity of congratulating you on your initiative to foster relations between our two countries, and in particular, the Binational Commission under the guidance of Vice President El Go and our Deputy President Thabo Mbegi is one shining example of the cooperation between the two countries. The new struggle in our country, South Africa, is a struggle for socio-economic growth. It is a struggle against poverty. It is a struggle against joblessness. It is a struggle against squalor. And I believe that it can be successfully won if we cooperate amongst these two people. The legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King lives on. His life and times are remembered by all of us, and his dream is becoming true every day of our lives. May the ideals that he fought and died for live forever. May his dream of peace reign on earth. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Mr. Minister Hadabe for being here today to represent President Nelson Mandela. Thank you all very much for your presence here today. Hallelujah is the highest praise that one can give to God. And at this time, I'm going to ask you to join and stand and sing together lifted, with lifted voices, hallelujah, as the highest praise from Handel's Messiah. I'm going to call on Mr. Ronald K. Hobson, who is uh, vice president at the Signet Bank in, in, Balt um, in uh, Maryland and a member of the Board of Advisors of the King Center to come and give our offertory appeal. And just to say that he is a young man in corporate America who has been supporting the King Center throughout the years as he serves in that position, seeking to get the support of members of the corporate community. Mr. Hobson. Those of you who do not know, it is the King Center's mission to eliminate poverty and war and racism around the world. And if there was ever a more crucial time to, to support the King Center, the time is now, because there's a battle going on in Washington and it is not a battle between the President and the Congress. It is not a battle between the Democrats or Republicans nor liberals of conservatives. It is a battle over what is moral and what is just. And that's what this fight is all about. And this is why it's so important for us to, to put Dr. King's philosophical thought to the forefront of the American agenda, a philosophy that is based on the, Chris, on the Christian principles of love, compassion, and understanding. And it is without your financial support this mission cannot be achieved. Now, I stand ready as a, as a visionary of the new generation. I stand ready and prepared to give $1,000 this morning. Because if, if, if $1,000 is a price that I must pay to rid this nation from racial hatred, to keep America from turning its back on its poor, and to maintain peace throughout the world, then I have not given up anything. I have, in fact, gained something. Amen. And so I'm asking you today, if you could give $1,000 or more this morning to stand. I'm asking you to stand so that we can carry on the gospel of justice beyond the walls of this church. I'm asking you to stand, my friend. And as the words of the young people, don't leave me hanging. And if you cannot, give $1,000 a day, I'm asking you to give 500 If you can get, cannot give 500 I'm asking you, thank you very, thank you very much, Brother Johnson. And I'm asking you, if you cannot give 500 a 100 will do. But please give, for I need not remind you that those who profess to be Christian and righteous and are in direct conflict with the Christian principles of compassion, understanding, and love, they are giving generously 
to their organization. So we must somehow steer our misguided brothers and sisters back into the fold. And this is why I'm asking you to stand with me. And as I close, I'm asking you to the men, to the men who marched the million strong in Washington in last October, and all the men of goodwill, I'm asking you to stand with me today. And yes, to the women who have been the genuine strength of character and the compassionate agitator for change, will you stand with me? Will you stand with me, the educators, the unsung heroes of this nation, who bear witness to the fact that the that, that nation's most precious resource, her youth, are being destroyed by cynicism and deceit? And to the political leaders here, I'm asking you to stand. To my brothers and sisters who live abroad, who are gathered here and have witnessed the end of apartheid, through the, and who have witnessed through the powers, the creative forces of the power of the nonviolent social chain, I'm asking you to also stand with me. And finally, to a nation, a nation in need, a nation wait, waiting to exhale the breath of love and compassion onto its people, I'm asking you to stand and unite together. Thank you. I, want, I also want to, uh, to let you know that uh, there are those who contribute $1,000 today. Uh, president, sorry, uh, Mr. Clarence Avant, the president of Motown uh, Records, uh, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, uh, Mr. Jesse Hill, and I should also add that I came here with $7,000 in contributions from friends around the world. Thank you. Due to time restraints, we usually take an opportunity to recognize those of you, uh, many of you in the audience. We will not be able to, to do that today. But again, we say we thank you for coming. We welcome you. We have elected officials. We have friends and supporters of the King Center. Thank you for your presence here today. Whenever one stands before us to sing music, we oftentimes say that that is a talented person. But today we have one with us who, when he sings, inspires our hearts. And it is because I believe of the anointing of God on his life. At this time, I'm going to call on Reverend Wintley Phipps to come and render us a selection.
the sound that saved a wretch like me. blind but now I see sing God's praise than when we first begun. Hallelujah, It's hard to be a preacher and not say something after that. <laughs> but I'm going to let the Spirit of God deal with you. As we have some time constraints. I have a very difficult task to accomplish in a very brief moment. To introduce the woman who birthed me. Who raised me who nurtured me, who taught me, who showed me the way. And oftentimes when we think of introductions, uh, we typically talk about what one has done, their accomplishments. But today I simply want to focus on not what Mrs. Coretta Scott King has done, for we know those things. And we all have different opinions about those things. But I want you to understand who Coretta Scott King is. That inspired her to do the things that she has done. When I think of my mother, the one word that I will leave with you today 
as I introduce her, is the word faithful. In this life, we oftentimes seek to be successful. We oftentimes seek to do good things and to be good people. And while those are good virtues, God has created us to be faithful. What is being faithful? Well, when you lose a loved one, and you are told after you lose that loved one that you ought to stay home and merely raise your children and leave it to the men folks to carry on such a heavy legacy. What is faithful? Faithful is understanding what God said when he said through the prophet Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and so Mrs. Coretta Scott King is faithful because she sought to capture the knowledge, the vision, the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and propel them not only to the forefront of this nation but to the world at large and set out on a journey to institutionalize what is faithful. Faithful is when you come up against opposition and persecution and you still continue to focus on your vision and, and your purpose in spite of the persecution. Coretta Scott King could do that because she understood that blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of God. Faithful, this is who this woman is faithful because she understood when people told her that she couldn't and she shouldn't and I don't think it's going to happen when it came time to create an institution she understood what the woman with the issue of blood understood and that was that I've got to press my way to my vision and my mission and my purpose faithful is this woman a woman who, in the face of fears, in the face of threats, understood that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For As God. they came together within her, they are the very things that defined her as faithful and caused her to stay faithful. And I want to say to you, mother, continue to keep the faith. Because the word of God says that when you are faithful over a few things, hallelujah, I will make you ruler over many. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank God for my faithful mama. Because even though we face some difficult and some challenging days ahead, I can continue to press on because of her inspiration, because of the spirit that lives in her, I can continue to press on. I introduce to you, present to you, this woman of God, this Esther of our time, who was called for such a time as this, the founding president of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change, Mrs. Coretta Scott King. Let us welcome them. Thank you, Reverend Bernice King, my youngest daughter, to President Clinton, Senator Coverdale, Representatives Mfume, 
Representative Lewis, Governor Miller, Mayor Campbell, all of our distinguished dais persons and distinguished persons in this audience. It is a great pleasure and honor to be with you all today for this annual commemorative service on Martin Luther King's holiday. Mr. President, between the snowstorm, the federal budget, negotiations, and your mission to Bosnia, I know you have had an exceptionally difficult week. We are all the more grateful to you for having taken the time to come here and to be our keynote speaker for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. It's not my job to introduce you this morning and this afternoon, Mr. President, but I'd like to say how much I admire your leadership and what you have stood, what you have stood for and print the principles of decency throughout this difficult period. And please, Mr. President, convey to our, our appreciation to Mrs. Clinton, a truly great First Lady. Very much. Very much in the spirit of Eleanor Roosevelt. It is my job, however, to introduce our next speaker. I have, of course, known Dexter Scott King all of <laughs> his life and half of mine. We've done all the things uh, any mother and son would do. We've enjoyed each other's company. We've worked and played together. We've laughed and cried and prayed together and struggled together with each other. We've had thousands of heart-to-heart -heart conversations and not a few arguments. We've shared suffering and joy and all of the experience of a full, rich life. As you might imagine, during this time, I've gained some insight into his character and what he is about. Over the years, I have sometimes thought about what qualities he has inherited from his father. Many people have noted a physical resemblance, and I would concur with that. There's also a voice, a well-rounded baritone that sounds very much like Martin. And like his father, we can be, he can be quite eloquent and persuasive. He is intuitive and analytical, and I think he may get some of that from me. Oh <laughs> he is deliberate and methodical in the way he approaches challenges. He is thoughtful and careful to consider all options before he makes decisions. He is an excellent listener. But once he decides what he wants to do, don't even think about changing his mind. <laughs> I very much admire his determination and perseverance and his commitment to achieve his goals regardless of criticism. Dexter brings to his leadership of the King Center imagination, vision, tempered by a passion for organization and management and a clear sense of priorities. He has integrity, compassion, and most important of all, an unwavering dedication to using his skills and talents to carry forth the work of Martin Luther King, Jr. I'm proud of this young man, and I think we can expect great things from him. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Chairman, President, and CEO of the King Center, Dexter Scott King. Thank you, Madam Founder, for that very gracious introduction. They say nobody knows you like your mother, and that goes for the good and the bad. I'm sure there's a lot more you could have said, so I'm just grateful you stopped where you did. <laughs> just want to take a moment and say to President Clinton, 
Uh, one of the first things I did when I took office a year ago was to issue an executive order that I would try and keep this service short <laughs> in keeping with passing the torch to a new generation. But you know, my Congress overruled me. <laughs> and I have to say to all of you, and especially to the audience, thank you for your patience. But you know, when the spirit gets going, sometimes you lose track of time. Yes. So I want to thank you, but we're getting close to that very special moment. On behalf of the King Center, I want to thank all of the participants for joining us today. Let me express my gratitude as well to the Commemorative Service Committee and everyone who has been involved in producing this beautiful service celebrating the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Today, it is with my great honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker. It is always very difficult to introduce someone who needs no introduction. But my task is all the more enjoyable by the high regard and personal admiration I have for him, as well as for the First Lady, who I also feel has served our country with the same passion and commitment as Eleanor Roosevelt. Before I introduce him, I would like to take a moment to share a personal reflection about an experience I had with the President in 1994. My brother and I were invited to accompany President Clinton and members of the Kennedy family aboard Air Force One to take part in a groundbreaking for a memorial in Indianapolis. The memorial was to commemorate Senator Robert Kennedy's famous speech, comforting the black community on the night of my father's assassination. And President Clinton, we were very honored to be there with you. The President was gracious enough to come sit with us in the back of the plane and chat with us for a while. Well, well, I said to myself, we've come a long way when the president is sitting in the back of the bus. I mean, plane. <laughs> and if it will make Speaker Gingrich feel any better, I would like him to know that when Air Force One landed, all of the guests departed by the back door. <laughs> At least we know this president does not practice discrimination. <laughs> On a more serious note, President Clinton has amassed a truly remarkable record of accomplishments in just three years of his administration. First, there are eight and a half million more jobs in America today than when he took his sacred oath of office. The official unemployment rate for African Americans is now in the single digit range for the first time since the Vietnam War. To further reduce unemployment, President Clinton has initiated a range of reforms, including liberalization of trade, investment in job training, and empowerment zone legislation. President Clinton has also secured a significant increase in the earned income tax credit for low-income Americans. He has dramatically increased funding for Head Start, and he has expanded support for historically black colleges by $100 million. His leadership has resulted in major legislative victories, including the passage of the Brady Bill and the ban on assault weapons, which will save the lives of thousands of Americans. He passed the Motor Voter Act of 1993, and he has vigorously opposed all efforts to undermine minority voting rights. President Clinton has taken a courageous and principled stand against the politics of racial polarization, and he has spoken out clearly and unequivocally and in support of affirmative action. In the current budget negotiations, President Clinton has refused to be intimidated, and he has held the line against cuts in critical services for senior citizens, people with disabilities, low income, and other disadvantaged Americans.
The achievements of the Clinton administration in foreign policy have been equally impressive. When his critics opposed intervention in Haiti, President Clinton went ahead and his leadership secured the peaceful restoration of democracy in Haiti. President Clinton has made improving relations with African nations a leading prior priority of U.S. foreign policy. He has sent more presidential delegations to Africa than any other administration. He is the only president to host a White House conference on Africa. And he has provided significant support for President Mandela's nation-building efforts. At his direction, the Clinton administration has become the most diverse, racially inclusive administration in history. President, <laughs> President Clinton has appointed more African Americans and women to high-level policy-making positions than any president in U.S. history. <laughs> including a record five African Americans to head cabinet departments in addition, black Americans hold the second ranking positions in the Departments of Defense, Housing and Urban Development, and Health and Human Services. A record 47 African Americans serve on the White House staff, including the head of the White House Personnel Office. And he has appointed more black Americans to federal judgeships than any of his predecessors. Back in the early days of the Civil Rights Movement, my father made a daring prediction. He said that one day the southern states would produce a generation of progressive white elected officials who would do justly and love mercy. He said they would work together with their fellow citizens of all races with mutual respect and a vibrant spirit of goodwill for the common good of the nation. In recent years, we have witnessed the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy. And the man I introduced to you provides us with a fine example. Our president's fundamental decency was underscored for me as a son touched by the tragedy of assassination, by the sincere and heartfelt remorse he expressed when Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated, and the comfort he offered to Mr. Rabin's family. When I think about the many difficult challenges our nation's leader faces, I am reminded of what my father said about how a great leader handles controversy. And he said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. He went on to say, politics asks the question, is it popular? Vanity asks the question, forgive me, that's politics asks the question, is it expedient? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience, and I repeat, conscience asks the question, is it right? I believe that this president is sincerely trying to do what is right. May we continue to pray for him and wish him Godspeed with all of his many challenges. Therefore, it is fitting on this 10th anniversary of the National King holiday that we hear from our nation's leader. Please join with me in receiving the Honorable William Jefferson Clinton, the 42nd President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that we have been here a long time, but aren't you glad you came? Dexter King, thank you for that fine introduction and for your leadership. Coretta King, uh, thank you for your kind remarks and 
for the visits we've had today and all the ones we've had in the past, to the other members of the King family who are here, and especially to our co-presiders. Yes. I'm glad they don't keep women out of the pulpit anymore, aren't you? <laughs> to uh, Senator Coverdell and my dear friend, Governor Miller, Mayor Campbell, you can get back in the pulpit, I think, anytime you want. <laughs> my longtime friend, Congressman John Lewis, and Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, Congressman Infume, my dear friend, we wish you well on your new mission. To all the ministers who are here and all others who spoke, to Dr. Roberts, thank you for letting us come to this church. I want to thank all those who came with me today, many from the White House, starting with the White House Chief of Staff and most of those who were referenced, and my good friend Ernest Green, Bob Johnson of the Black Entertainment Network, and uh, others who came. I want to say so many things, and yet I think I should say so little, because I have already heard so much wisdom and humor, <laughs> and passion, and music. I'm going to do a test when I get back on the airplane, when I go back to the back of the airplane. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Weldon Latham, and Bob Johnson, and Ernie Green, and all my staff members what they remembered about this, this long ceremony. Everyone will remember you, young man. Because you remind us of what all this is all about. And you are a stern rebuke to the cynics who say we cannot do better. I will remember something that the rest of you couldn't know, and that is that Coretta Scott King still has a beautiful voice and can hit all the high notes. <laughs> I remember this is the first time in my life I ever got to sing Lift Every Voice and sing two days in a row, because we sang it in church yesterday. I will remember that the mayor wants to be buried by a southern preacher so he can stay on earth one more hour. <laughs> I remember that it was so cold in Washington, Dick Gregory was willing to go to hell to get away from it. <laughs> I will remember all this incredible music and uh, David Arnold, whom I had never heard before, and my friend and brother, Wentley Phipps, who can still bring tears to my eyes. For purely personal reasons, I will never forget the way you all stood when the mayor mentioned my wife's name, and I thank you for that. Just, uh, I will never forget my friend Governor Miller coding Chris Christopherson's song, and thinking there's still a place for all us Southern rednecks in this church. <laughs> I'm glad to see uh, my good friends. I see Edwin Moses and Sonny Walker out there. And those of us who are your fans, Mr. Fishman, are glad to see you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was sitting here thinking as everyone else spoke, and I kept marking things through in my remarks. What might I say here? What would Dr. King say if he sort of showed up, sidled down the aisle? I think he would have enjoyed this, don't you? All the laughing, all the singing, all the wisdom, all the passion. 
think he would have said amen when Congressman Mpume reminded us of that magnificent passage from Genesis, you can kill the dreamer but not the dream. I think he'd be pretty proud of how far his hometown has come. The King Center is keeping the dream alive. Atlanta has more foreign corporations than any other American city headquartered here with this mayor and that police chief and that sheriff over there. Less than 200 days from today, the whole world will be looking at Atlanta when the Olympics come. The city too busy to hate will be the city the world will see. I think he would like that. You know, only three Americans have ever had a holiday name for them by the Congress. Two were presidents. George Washington helped to create our union. Abraham Lincoln laid down his life to preserve it. Martin Luther King never held any elected office, but he is the third because he redeemed the moral purpose of the United States. He reminded us that since all of us are created equal, and that's what the Constitution says, all of us are equally entitled to the full benefits of American citizenship. In this holiday, we celebrate the life of a man who challenged us to face our flaws and to become a better nation, to use our great power in the service of peace and justice. That was his dream, and that is the spirit of this holiday. And that is why it is a good thing that all over America, this is a legal national holiday. It is altogether fitting that if we can lay down our labors for a little while, once a year to think about how we started. Yes, yes, yes. And we lay down our labors a little while, once a year to think about how we might have been torn apart, but we stayed together. That we take one day a year to remember that we have to live by the spirit and letter of the Constitution of the United States. When we were coming in here, Rodney Slater, who is now the Federal Highway Administrator, but was with me when I was governor, reminded me Mrs. King, that 10 years ago today I sent on an early morning 30 young children from Arkansas to Atlanta to march in the parade. And those children thought they had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> they knew they were part of something that mattered. So if Dr. King were here today, how would he tell us that it matters? I just returned, as all of you know, from a visit to our brave men and women serving as peacekeepers in Bosnia. I think he'd be pleased by that, don't you? Our troops come from all parts of our country, from all racial and religious and ethnic groups. They comprise a diversity unmatched anywhere in the world, and unfortunately unmatched in any other organization in this country. They are all committed to equal opportunity, equal responsibility, and excellence. I wish all of you could have been with me walking down the lines reviewing the troops. First, there's a little unit with a big captain who's six foot four, comes from an industrial city in the Middle West, from an Eastern European ethnic group. Next, there's a unit captained by a young slip of a woman, barely five feet tall, African American woman, bossing around all these big hulking guys. Why? because she was judged by her merit. Yes, they have an affirmative action program, but no one gets a job for which they are not competent. All right. All right. It was a beautiful thing to see. But more important than the composition of the military is the mission on which they went, a mission we can all identify with. Bosnia is a land that in the past has found strength in its diversity. The Muslims, the Croats, who were Catholic, and the Serbs, who were Orthodox, they have flourished side by side in the past. Even though they prayed apart, they lived and worked together. They've been neighbors and friends and even family members. In giving in to appeals to primitive and 
blind hatred. Those who started that awful war there were stepping back into an imagined, unreal past in which they say life has greater integrity and meaning when we define ourselves in terms of who we are not instead of who we are. Does that sound familiar to you? When we define ourselves by whom we can denigrate and debase instead of those whom we can reach out to and embrace. We Americans understand the challenges they're facing in Bosnia. We know it's hard to forge a community from many different groups. It's hard to lay down old hatreds and ancient biases. We also know, as that old Broadway song says, children have to be taught to hate. I was thinking, y'all were making all those jokes about the bus and the airplane. You know what I was thinking about? When I was a kid growing up in my hometown in Arkansas, I rode the city bus to school every day. It cost a nickel. I can still remember one day when I got on the bus, I had four cents. And there was a bus stop in front of my house and one about a block behind my house. And I asked the bus driver if he'd let me off behind with four cents, let me run up and get another penny and run down to the front and give it to him. And he did. That was the old days. But I was a kid. I, admit, I was so stupid, I thought the best place to sit was the back of the bus. They had to run me out of the back so other people could sit down. They were supposed to be there. I thought I was supposed to be in the back of the bus. Children have to be taught to hate. We know about what they're going through in Bosnia. Though our founding fathers celebrated in our documents the universal rights of man as being inherent in human nature, we actually started out with a constitution that stated that slaves were not fully citizens, and by the language of the constitution, therefore, not fully human. We fought a civil war over race and slavery. We lived through bitter days of lynchings and riots. Still today, we struggle to overcome. But over time, Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy, others have helped us to see that history need not be our destiny. We can define ourselves by our hopes and not our fears. Most of all, we can understand that we are stronger when we live and work together as a community, not as a swarm of isolated individuals, or antagonistic groups, that is still the decision for America today. In the great budget debate, I believe, some disagree, I believe we ought to balance the budget. We never had a permanent deficit until the 12 years before I became president. Deficits were things that we ran when we had recessions are great wars that required us to mobilize the energies of the country. So we have to do it, but we have to balance the budget in a balanced way that recognizes that we are all in this together. That is the struggle of America's whole history. That is the mission in Bosnia. We know that we have to be liberated, not bound by the lessons of the past. Dr. King said that Men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they can't communicate with each other. They can't communicate with each other because they're separated from each other. The sad lesson of our experience is that sometimes we can be standing next to one another and still be separated from each other, miles and miles away in our minds. Now. Even as we seek to help others bridge their differences, we have to say today, and he would say to us, you still got a ways to go yourselves. We must be the world's drum major for peace. That's the role our troops and their allies from over 20 other countries, including countries that we were enemies with in the Cold War, are playing in Bosnia. That's what we're trying to do in helping the Catholics and Protestants get together in Northern Ireland. That's what we're trying to do in working with the Arabs and the Jews in the Middle East. And I thank President King for his mention of my friend, Prime Minister Rabin. Like Dr. King, he gave his life in the struggle for peace. 
And like so many of you who took up Dr. King's torch, Shimon Perez and others have taken his torch up. I'm glad that the United States is working with them. I'm proud that the United States has supported the reconciliation of the peoples of South Africa and the triumph of President Mandela and all of you who work with him. That has been an honor for us, not a burden. If that is our role, to be drum majors for peace and justice around the world, surely, surely that must be our responsibility here at home. We have much to be thankful for. Dexter King mentioned some things. I'm glad that in the last three years, the crime rate and the welfare rolls and the food stamp rolls and the poverty rate and the teen pregnancy rate are all down. I'm proud of that. But, Here's what I think Dr. King would say if he were giving this sermon in far more powerful and eloquent ways. You're doing better, but that's not nearly good enough. And don't do anything which will make it worse. Keep going in the right direction. There needs to be more peace and freedom on our streets. It is true that the murder rate had its biggest decline in 35 years last year. Hallelujah. It's also true a lot of innocent kids will get killed this year. We have to do better. There's still too much crime and violence and drugs in America, especially among our young people. He would say, ask yourselves this question as you walk out of this church today. How can it be that the crime rate in America is down, but the crime rate among young people between the ages of 12 and 17 is up? Yes. Are they still out there raising themselves? What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about that? We have to continue to heal the racial divisions that still tear at our nation. We can't rest until there are no more hate crimes, no more racial violence, and until we have moved beyond those far more subtle but still pervasive racial divisions that keep us from becoming one nation under God. We have to be honest about where we are in this struggle. The job of ending discrimination in this country is not over. That's why I still believe we need the right kind of affirmative action. We can mend it, and someday we can end it. But we can't end it until everybody with a straight face can say there is no more discrimination on the basis of race. We must bring more peace to our public discourse, even when we passionately disagree. We did a lot of laughing today, to some extent at the expense of those who disagree with us. That's OK. They laugh at me, too, and sometimes more. But let's remember, no matter how passionately Martin Luther King spoke about the wrongs he saw, and the changes he advocated, he always, always spoke in the language of love and nonviolence and peace. I remember uh, when one of our clergy read that well-known but never tired passage from Corinthians. In the old King James Version, it used to say, now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know even as we are known. And there abides faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these is charity. Charity and love, in that sense, are the same things. Charitable love. The understanding that even those who are totally different from us share a common human nature, and, because, and we all see through the glass darkly. Nobody has the whole truth. We should remember that and we should ask them to. And finally, let me say, I think he would say that this is going to be a great age of possibility, the 21st century, and many will do very well. The great issue is whether we will go into that age of possibility together or divided, whether America will be a society, a great society, where winners can take everything, or whether it will be an even greater society in which everyone has a chance to win. 
If you think about the characteristics of this time, people care more about their racial and their ethnic identities. If that builds pride and self-esteem and gets people back to good values that we all share, it is a good thing. If it leads people to the Bosnian War, or killing in Northern Ireland, or a lack of resolution in South Africa, or continued carnage in the Middle East, or on our own streets, it is a bad thing. If you look at this global marketplace, if it means that a poor child in inner city Atlanta, or in rural Arkansas in the hills of the Ozarks, can hook into a computer and get himself or herself into a research library in Australia and learn what's going on in the world. If people in the inner cities can use technology to learn things that they couldn't learn and to build businesses and hope and opportunity, that is a very good thing. But if the global economy means that everywhere we have to have more inequality, more people thrown out of work, more people living without hope, because those of us who are doing well won't set up the conditions in which everyone can win, it is not a good thing. So the challenge of this time is to go forward together. To go forward together. And every single one of us has a role to play. Let me remind you that in 1994, I signed legislation which transformed Martin Luther King's birthday into a national day of service to reflect the life and legacy of Dr. King. I recently appointed a friend of Dr. King's and an advisor, former Senator Harris Wofford, to head our Corporation for National Service. He said the King holiday should be a day on, not a day off, a day of action, not a day of apathy, a day of responding to the community, not a day of rest and recreation. That's what we have tried to do. Today, all across America, members of AmeriCorps, our national service organization are working with grassroots community volunteers to pull this country together, not to let it be divided. In Philadelphia, as we meet here, thousands of young people and their teachers are renovating homes for Habitat for Humanity, a project that started here in Georgia and has swept the whole world. In California, 2,300 young people are going to clean parks, remove graffiti, collect food and clothing for people who need it. And as we stand here and sit here, Right here in Atlanta, members of the National Service Corps are joining forces with a coalition of citizens to honor the memory of Martin Luther King by painting classrooms, working at their food banks, renovating a homeless shelter. Every American can be a drum major for peace. Every American can be a voice for justice. Every American can be a servant in the never-ending work of building our American community and building a stronger and more united and more decent world. As he said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Because of all of you today, I leave with a heart more full of grace, a soul more generated by love. I thank you for that and hope you feel the same way. God bless you all. As we now bring this session to a close, it has been a glorious day. We again thank Mr. President and all of our participants on the program and thank each of you for coming. We'll now ask uh, Reverend Pelt to come for the benediction and we will all end the program by the, singing the anthem of the movement, We Shall Overcome. May we bow our heads. O 
O great and kind God, we thank thee for allowing us the privilege to be a part of this memorable day. You have allowed us the chance to participate in another important chapter in actualizing the dream. May the expressions heard here today long linger on our minds days to come. And may, may each person be encouraged to implement these principles whenever and wherever the opportunity presents itself. For these words have challenged our minds. They have warmed our hearts. They have motivated us to endeavor to make this world a better place. A place where we can anticipate a brighter tomorrow. O oh, great Jehovah, bless all those who have participated in this tribute to the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and to his dream of justice, freedom, and liberation. O oh God, may your blessings be upon us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, everyone said, Amen.
as we end the service, Mr. Johnny Mack, Chief Administrative Officer of the King Center, will give further directions. As we hum softly, we shall overcome. We're going to ask the entire congregation to please be seated. Our President, uh, Bill Clinton, Mr. King and Mrs. Kling will leave the podium. All other podium guests, please be seated. All other platform guests, other than the President, Mrs. King, Mr. King, please be seated. All others, please remain seated, please. Please remain seated. Secret Service has asked that we follow specific instructions. 